Okay, so tell us about the new study that you published about a rising snow lines for the Sierra. Yeah, so we evaluated a number of climate projections that have been developed for the state as a way to add to the story of how a warming climate is going to influence our snowpack and therefore our water resources and our recreation. And what we did was looked at a, a method to estimate the snow line elevation. So where the snow turns to rain. So you could think about that as where you need to put chains on, uh, typically in the mountains. And at that elevation, that's where we start to accumulate our snowpack. And, and below that, that's where we have rain. And so as, as we saw this year, if you have rain falling on top of snow and that snow is ready to melt, that can lead to some flooding issues and leads to um, us having to deal with that water as a hazard rather than a resource. And so there's a lot of concern going forward with warming that a rise in the average elevation of the snow line is going to lead to more rain on snow events and is going to increasingly result in our water not being stored in the snowpack in the mountains, but coming downstream and impacting our reservoirs. So we use the sequence of about five climate projections to that are kind of decided to be the best for California and evaluated how the, the average snow line will change and then also the snow line during our biggest storms, which you may often hear referred to as atmospheric rivers. And so those tend to be, but not always, are warm, very wet storms and typically have higher snow lines. And the concern going forwards is that we're going to receive an increasing fraction or proportion of our precipitation from atmospheric rivers. And if those are typically warm, we wanted to know how much those will also warm because we'll be more and more reliant on those. And if they tend to be warmer and warmer, that's gonna mean less water that's stored in our mountains for later use for irrigation or ecological applications um, as well as drinking water. And so we, looked at all these different factors and found that uh, indeed we do expect to see about a 1600 foot rise in the average elevation of the winter snow line by the end of the century, assuming no climate change mitigation strategies. And so we've heard similar stories um, about research on this before. Uh, what was different about your findings and what you found with your team? So I believe our study is the first to explicitly look at that rain snow transition elevation. There's There's been a lot of work done in the past several decades that has looked at peak snowpack or um, how much snow we will get during a given winter and how much that will kind of come out to be our, you know, our grand total that we measure in March, April, and May. And so our study is a little different in that we were really looking at the elevation at which that rain and snow line is going to change. And as such, we could start connecting that to the hydrology in a little bit of a different way, because we can say if um, a certain fraction of the mountains are now below that snow line elevation, that may have some significant implications for the stream flow and runoff and, and subsequent flooding, but also thinking about how our mountain reservoirs will change, um, both the reservoirs that we rely on that we've built and the snowpack itself, which is kind of our, our best natural reservoir that we have. Uh, I was thinking about when I when I saw this study that we have this epic year <laughs> uh, and it may make it a little bit harder to really drive home the point that our, our snow line is going to be going up. You may go in the winter and there is no snow. Uh, what do you think about years like what we just had? And will that make a difference? Uh, is there a possibility that we could see these outliers in our Sierra snowpack? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, and it's really easy to go, wow, we had this great year. Maybe, maybe this change isn't taking place. But one major expectation with a warming climate is this increase in variability. So we're expecting for the next handful of decades to see these big oscillations between occasional very huge snow years like this one and years where there's almost nothing like that you don't have to go back too many years to, to remember where that took place. And even last year, we had a great December and we we're off to an awesome start. And then we had this 
very long dry spell in the middle of our, our typically uh, snowiest time. So seeing big years like this are great because we can enjoy it and take advantage of it and do all kinds of skiing. And it's fantastic for the reservoirs and for the general water resources and the, the river rafting and the ecosystems. But I think we need to keep in mind that these kinds of years are going to become less likely to influence all elevations with a lot of snow as things get warmer. And we really want to make sure to take as much advantage of them as we possibly can. So when we get these awesome years with a ton of water, how can we store that water and use it more efficiently so that if next year or say the next three or four years are very dry, we've seen plenty of multi-year droughts in California and that is not going to go away. How can we most efficiently optimize the water that we have to extend it longer into the future? And I think these big years are great because they give us a little bit of a buffer to give us a little bit more time to figure that out. But it's a, an issue that we all need to be thinking about and working on water conservation and more creative water management strategies going forwards. So what do you think should be done with the information that you've published? I think a big piece is going to be thinking about how can we start to re, let me think about what the right word there is. A big part is going to be thinking about how we can adjust the water management approaches that we have to be more flexible. So instead of following this flood rule curve that we've had for many, many decades now, um, can we shift that a little bit to be able to store more water during the middle of the winter uh, if we don't think we're going to get more? And also thinking about what other types of methods can we use to conserve water across the board in all the different sectors of the economy? Um, so urban use, agricultural use, basically all, of, all, all hands on deck are needed to really think about what can we do and where can we move water when we do have a lot of water um, so things like managed aquifer recharge, um, moving that water and storing it in different ways, and, and really just coming up with a, a large and very creative, likely, uh, suite of methods and strategies that we can rely upon when we move into a future with increased variability, where some years are huge, some years are very, very dry, and overall, everything will be warmer and drier. And so what's the timeline for the higher snow line, the snow levels, and then what are the potential impacts of not having as much snow? Um, you talked about the reservoirs. What are some other things that could be affected? So the timeline is, it's pretty short. Um, while we still expect to see a lot of variability and still some excellent years, this year being a prime example, um, we have been documenting historic change and rises in the snow line, and so that is expected to continue. Uh, however, the next five to 10 years are going to be really critical in terms of limiting how much warming we commit ourselves to towards the end of the century. We're kind of at this point where you can kind of go along the curve in two different ways, either a, a much worse outcome or a uh, much better than the worst case outcome. So we have a lot of work we can do, and it's a really good opportunity in the coming years to make a lot of progress that will uh, have substantial positive implications for us and our future generations. And as far as other impacts, so the water resources and reservoirs is a, a really big one right at the forefront, um, but there are other impacts that affect uh, lots of rural economies. Many of our mountain towns and, and mountain communities are, are highly reliant on tourism. And so if we lose our snowpack, that winter tourism uh, will decline substantially as well as the summer tourism for things um, like boating or river rafting and other kinds of activities. And then we're also quite concerned with as we increase the elevation at which snow falls, um, the presence of that snow and how that uh, snow kind of keeps things a little moister and cooler into the, the warmer months, at least as we get started into those warm months, the loss of that snowpack is going to mean that our landscapes will dry out sooner. And so that exposes a lot more of our mountain area to the risk of severe wildfire, which we know has big, bad implications for life and property, public health locally from air quality impacts, but also really continental scales. Um, in terms of the, the smoke impacts can reach far downstream. 
Um, and then I think some of the other kind of key negative impacts of a rising snow line are um, beyond the water resources and the economy, um, those other ecological ones where uh, many critters and plants that have adapted for snowy environments are not going to see that snow as much. And that's going to change how well some of these critters that live beneath the snowpack or, or rely on the snow um, for insulation in the winter months are going to be able to survive. So we're going to see some basically across the board impacts um, from a rising snow line. And that kind of should lead to additional motivation to make some positive changes here in the coming decades so that we can preserve our snowy future. So I do sense uh, a little bit of optimism there that there is something that we can do to try to slow the warming, reduce our carbon emissions, and maybe limit some of the impacts that we are seeing there. Um, how hopeful are you? And what are some of those things specifically uh, that we can do now to try to change this and keep this from being our future? Um, I'm fairly optimistic. I think I think we we know what we need to do, and we have the capability to do it. It's just finding finding the will to reduce energy consumption across all of the different sectors, um, becoming more efficient in a lot of the things that we do. I don't think we'll have to have tremendous changes to our way of life, but we will need to have some changes, um, and those are difficult from personal to political reasons. Um, but by and large, we really need to figure out how to um, generate energy in a much cleaner fashion um, to reduce overall consumption kind of across all of the ways that we use energy um, and how we get places. Um, but all of those make very positive impacts that will make our own lives today better and healthier and cleaner, but also going forwards into the future that will really be where some of these benefits are going to uh, have a positive impact on the, the future generations to come. And is there anything else that you'd like to add or something that we left out from the study that you'd like to make sure that we include in this story? I think you got it all. Um, yeah, a little bit of optimism is always good. Um, we, we can do it and we have the capability to do so. Um, we just got to get psyched and do it. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Ben Hatchett from the Desert Research Institute. Thank you for joining me this morning. Yeah, thank you very much. It was great to be here.